Hello. How are we doing? <laughs> Good morning. Uh, for me, it's morning, actually. Uh, for you guys, I don't know. It might be a little bit later. Uh, hi, um, I'm Papa Whiskey. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, it's great to see you all. And uh, we're going to talk about strategy today. How's that sound? Awesome. Um, so I can see you guys chatting, which is really great. So uh, feel free to chat, ask questions, uh, do all that uh, niceness there. And I will uh, see what you have to say and um, uh, respond to them as I can. Cool. Um, if you have any uh, uh, technical problems, you can hit up uh, Facebook or chat if, if there's an issue. Uh, someone will help you out with that. Um, uh, there's going to be people um, handling that. Um, also, there is the Microsoft Translator. Um, so if you uh, are not English by default, then you can um, use the Microsoft Translator uh, app in order to um, essentially uh, get it in a, a different language. Uh, but yeah, so do I have everybody, is everybody here? It's like, it looks like uh, we have a reasonable number of people. Cool. All right, um, so we're going to talk about strategy. We're going to talk about specifically um, adjusting your strategy during a game. Um, we're going to talk about how uh, the different dimensions um, of adjusting your strategy um, so that you can identify what can change and then make those changes. Okay. So I want to pitch a scenario. It's Friday, three weeks ago. Uh, Denver Roller Derby and Arch Rival are squaring off against each other in an epic clash of high-level roller derby. The first half has been full of hard-hitting action leading to a close game at the end of the period. The score has been back and forth. Neither team seems to have an advantage. Denver is the numerical underdog. They're struggling against the formidable Arch defense, but Arch can't seem to deal with the powerhouse jammers that Denver brings to bear. After a 30-minute slog, there's an opportunity to talk to the team. The coaches ask for your advice, so what do you tell them? Um, if you don't have a great answer, that's okay. Uh, I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, everyone will have the ability to take a stab at it. Uh, the answers are there, but to get to them, you have to understand the shape of the problem. So, let's talk about what strategy can do for us. Um, first, I want to set your expectations. Uh, strategy itself is not a panacea. If you're losing 10 to 1, that's not a strategy problem. If you're up 100 points, fine adjustments of strategy are not going to get you much. They're, they're going to keep your lead, but they're not going to necessarily improve it. Uh, neither of those kinds of games is particularly painful. Uh, yeah, strategic adjustment can help you keep your lead or reduce the damage. But it, it doesn't change the outcome of the game. So. When is it the most important to adjust our approach? Well, that's when the game is close enough that our actions can still decide the outcome. Close games, and here I would say anything less than a 50-point spread, close games are about strategy. If you can't adapt to the situation on the track in those games, you're going to lose to teams who do. And that requires that we know what we can and should change. So I'm going to go over the different dimensions of strategy, uh, speed, offense and defense balance, attributes of your team, and the game environment. These dimensions aren't isolated. Uh, they're a web of interconnected pieces. So even though I'm talking about them independently, understand that they're all different parts of a whole. You can't adjust one without compensating in other areas. So uh, let's start with speed. Um, show of hands, uh, you can use the little hand icon in the lower right or whatever. Um, who likes to skate fast? 
<laughs> there's one. <laughs> All right. Um, and who likes to prefer the game? Who prefers the game to remain a bit more steady? Okay, couple hands there. Um, I want to get into some of the key aspects of both slow derby and fast derby and talk about how you can adjust along the speed spectrum. No matter which you feel comfortable with, uh, it's more important to know how to change it up than that you have one or the other kind of strategy. Cool, so let's talk about slow derby. Um, this is your Victorian, your crime city, your angel city, um, your Texas. None of these are teams I would call slow, but they all play a more solid, hard-hitting game. Slow teams um, want to hit people. They want to send people scattering like bowling pins. They want to dig in with their edges and grind progress to a halt. If you've ever gotten a stop block and been proud, slow derby might be your thing. <laughs> um, yes, uh, adjust your status now. <laughs> uh, secretly, slow derby is my favorite derby um, because play is slow. You can you can line up your blocks, you can run offensive plays, and when something finally gives, it gives very rapidly and dramatically. Uh, but it is called the grind for a reason. Slow derby is physically taxing. If you've ever done a wall sit until your leg burns or you've taken uh, been taken off your feet by someone coming across the track then you know it's a physically punishing game. Um, if you have a team composed of bigger gals, you're probably going to look to slow derby first. If your jammers are the kind to go down the middle and push, you're likely coaching a slow derby team. Uh, I'd say that most teams fall closer to this end of the spectrum than the other. On the other side is fast derby. So this is uh, your Calio, um, your Montreal, uh, your Dos Per Quattro, um, your Helsinki. And unlike slow derby, where I think there's some range where you can play slow derby with a little bit of speed, I think fast derby really does feel uncomfortably fast. In fact, I'd say that the discomfort with the speed is a strategic element that such teams leverage against their opponents. If you've ever been in a game where you were calling to get back to the pack, but it just didn't seem to help, that was a fast derby game. The techniques used playing derby at speed are a bit different. The kinds of hits you can do change. Uh, you can't make a huge carve at those speeds. But something like a hip hook can be you know, more useful. A fair amount of fast derby blocking is jockeying for position. Packs will get stretched out more easily. Uh, the faster, more agile jammer will have an advantage. It's important to note that just because the hits tend to be smaller doesn't mean the game is less physical. The kind of exertion skaters will have to deal with changes from strength to endurance, and as the game goes on, the exertion takes a toll. Plus, the times when a big hit does land at speed, one or both of the skaters involved tends to leave the track rapidly. So definitely physical, but in a different way than slow derby. Uh, the matchup between the speed of the teams in the game often determines the character of that game. Uh, let me show you. I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, so uh, here we have the matchups of what a game will be like based on how fast the teams involved want to go. Obviously, if both teams are playing slow, that leads to your typical slow but technical grindhouse game. Uh, this year's Angel City versus Rainy City in Acarina is a great example of this kind of game. Uh, there would be jams where a whole minute would go by uh, where all of the skaters were still in the start box. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, pretty, pretty physical, really great stuff. That's slow games. On the opposite side are the fast, fast games, uh, like uh, Stockholm versus Paris. Uh, I have to laugh sometimes because uh, when I watch games like this, um, the people operating the camera aren't always prepared for the speed. And sometimes you can feel them struggling to keep up. Uh, they're pulse pounding games. They could be on the higher scoring side. Uh, and they're especially challenging for more inexperienced refs. A lot of skating officials aren't used to skating that fast. 
So you don't always see the full range of penalties called. And of course, lastly, there's the, um, the mixed speed matchup, where one team is slow and one team is fast. Uh, unlike the other kinds, uh, these are the games where real outplay potential comes in. When it's two fast teams, you'll often see the teams struggle to outpace each other. Uh, with two slow derby teams, it's often about who is stronger, who can dig in better. But once you know which team can execute better in that space, that often is the team that has the advantage. But you do have options. If you train for both styles, you can start to speed up play when your opponent has you outsized. Uh, you can dig in when your opponent proves to be too fast to catch. It's all about knowing what to look for and how to adjust your play. Oh, um, speaking of which, we should talk about how to adjust your speed during play. Oops. Got to keep my slides in order. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, some of this is going to sound obvious. I, I assure you, skaters forget these points all the time, and so they bear repeating. Um, the first step to speeding up play is to skateboard. Uh, I recommend you practice this until your team is comfortable engaging at speed. You definitely do not want game day to be the first day you attempt fast derby. So run this in practice, where you have a, a pace setter on the inside of the track, and no skaters can be behind them. Have them move forward, and then force other players to move with them. On game day, you always want to ramp up your speed. If you're looking to play fast against the opposing team because you already know they're going to be hard to tackle in the slow game, start out pushing play forward and escalate from there. You'll ultimately be limited by how tightly pack is called, but if you're the one accelerating play, you'll likely be more prepared for a no pack situation than your opponent. Another really, really simple way to speed up play is to line up on the pivot line. If you move the packs forward, this gives jammers a bunch of initial speed before they hit the pack, and the whole mess will quickly push into the apex. You don't really want to have your jammers hit dead center of the wall if they're doing this. They'll want to target an edge. If they hit someone, it should be a corner. They can slip on the outside or underneath that corner. And in a similar way, offense can help stretch out the pack. Have your offense attack the enemy wall in front of the jammer, where the main goal is to get the opposing wall to move faster rather than to clear out a blocker. Once the pack is stretched out, your jammer should have an easier time navigating the pack. And finally, uh, if you want to speed up the pack, your jammers have to stop touching the opposing blockers straight up. <laughs> that means trying to get around them on the edges of the track. This means practicing waltz jumps, hurdle jumps, toe stop shuffles, crossover toe stop runs, all the other fancy tricks that a jammer might use to exploit the edge. Is this all clear, by the way? Um, hopefully this is all straightforward. I see someone typing. Amazing. Cool. I'm glad that's working out. All right. Yes, so far. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> All right. Cool. Um, yeah, so moving on to um, oh, I have, I have another, another typing person. It is a lot for a new coach. Uh, yes, you can definitely watch this over and over um, on the recorded video. And obviously, you can reach out to me if there's any questions. Um, I'm always available. All right, so let's talk about reducing speed. Um, on the other side of the coin, slowing play down means you can't let yourself just be baited into moving forward. You have to consci consciously dig in and force the other team to stop. That's definitely harder to do than say. The biggest thing is about identifying when and where you can stop. If you change your speed entirely within 10 feet of the existing pack, you should be able to yank on the forward skating, the skaters until they slow down. A lot of times, this will get them entirely stopped. But again, this is a thing you'll want to practice. I like to have two walls skate on the track and then practice slowing down dramatically, but still legally. It's easy to destroy the pack if you've never practiced that before. And of course, uh, if the pivot line is the home of the speed team, the jammer line is the home of the grind team. Depending on whether you feel like you have strength on your opponent, that will determine whether you want to be behind or in front of the opposing wall. 
but you'll want your wall close to the jammer line. Don't let the enemy jammer build up speed they can use to outmaneuver you. When you play offense, you want to focus on deforming offense. Um, now, that's not a common term, so I just want to unpack that a bit. When I say deforming offense, I mean offense that's designed to turn or displace your opponent. If you've heard the term uh, corral hit or shoulder throw, those are the kinds of hits I mean. But essentially, any hit that results in your opponent not facing derby direction is sufficient. When you make those hits, you mostly want to make them laterally on the track uh, rather than vertically, so, uh, so as to avoid encouraging your opponent to simply skate forward. You definitely don't want to be encouraging the pack to speed up. And finally, um, always be touching an opposing skater in some way. Uh, every time you're in contact with an opposing skater, that skater has to slow down or fight to keep their speed. If play speeds up, get in front of one blocker, one blocker, and slow them down. Uh, the more you touch uh, their wall overall, the slower the pack will get. OK, does that? Makes sense to everybody as well. Cool. Awesome. Uh, again, if you have any questions, just raise a hand or something. <laughs> All right, let's move on to balance. Uh, now, here I mean offensive versus defensive balance or aggressive balance. Uh, by a quick show of hands, who here is really focused on playing defensively and just not giving up any ground? <laughs> OK, awesome. <laughs> and who here feels like they have their offense dialed in? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? That's, it's, a, it's a formative skill. Right. All right, cool. I want to talk about aggression and how to balance your aggression with your need to guard against enemy aggression. Uh, in a game, you need to do both. But teams will usually focus more on one than the other. In my experience, more teams are comfortable with their defense than their offense. So I'm going to talk about defense first, and we'll move from there to offense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, most people are trying to add more offense to their game, so that's, uh, that's very understandable. All right, so defense. Playing defensively is a matter of focusing on protecting your own formations more than you do on disturbing your opponent's plans. In the ideal form, that means four blockers doing nothing but staying on top of the jam or the entire jam. That's not really what we do in modern derby, but it's good to think about the extremes. Instead, when we're focusing on defense, the offenses we play are more likely to be things like passive offense, where you intentionally cause the opposing team to drop a bridge by managing where pack is, or static offense, where you block an opposing wall from the front by slowing down. Uh, in both cases, our focus is on being available in case the rest of our wall needs us, and our first priority is the jammer. For jammers, we're usually talking about avoiding risks on the edges and sticking towards the center. A jammer will push forward towards either edge, but before getting too close to that edge, uh, they'll switch to the other direction. With modern derby, the jammer is critical to the success of the defense, because when they get recycled, the enemy blockers will descend upon our wall like vultures. <laughs> Strong defense um, really is uh, focused on geometric formations at this point. When we, when these sort of formations uh, became super popular, we started hearing a lot about cubes, which is simply a group of like four skaters where there are two side-by-side -side blockers and two braces in front of them. Because those structures were so strong, we had teams fielding more offense to deal with those problems. And now the typical structure is a triangle plus one offense. Either way, geometric defense is the most common form of blocking today. You'll see it at all levels of derby. Um, it really is kind of the, the mainstay of uh, modern roller derby. Um, so as part of that, you will usually see uh, defense-focused teams using uh, bicep links. And by bicep links, I mean um, when you link up, your hand is touching their bicep. Um, wall work tends to be closer. 
and more physical. And you'll see micro adjustments of the typical geometry of a triangle. So what I what I mean by that is pocketing. Pocketing is the most popular version of this, which is where a triangle has a blocker on its seam. And one of the two skaters touching the jammer moves to a position that's more alongside than in front of. Uh, does that make sense to people? Cool, awesome. So you, many of you have experienced this before. Um, so those little, those little adjustments uh, are very common when you are uh, looking at strong defense. Uh, yeah, so I have to find my slides. <laughs> right. So let's talk, let's talk about offense. Um, offense can be thought of as a dedication to ensuring that whatever your opponent has planned goes poorly. Um, these offensive moves are much more active and might be a single player playing dedicated O all the way up to zone style play where all four blockers are attempting to keep the enemy wall from reforming. Because offense is almost always played from an edge into the middle, you can see teams that focus on offense rely more on exploiting the edges of the track. While the strategies are a bit riskier, they can easily end up with your jammer off the track. Um, but they, they can also end up with your jammer making it entirely out of the pack. So a more offensive approach is also higher risk and a higher reward. Uh, it's, it's a balance between uh, putting yourself out there and what you're willing to, you know, what you can get out of it. As the aggression meter is turned up, wall formations will actually get more dynamic. Uh, geometry is never completely ignored. <laughs> you will see things like a triangle. Uh, where one of the corners will separate from the triangle and track back with the jammer as they back up. And they'll stick to that jammer until they move forward again and then they reform that triangle. This dynamism can lead to several blockers playing offense at once, which is what I like to refer to as a double tap offense. Uh, it's pretty great when you see it in motion. Um, it, it's kind of like you have a fifth blocker. Uh, and structurally, you'll see teams that focus more on offense and aggression often use more flexible linking to allow for more dynamic positions. Uh, so these teams tend to have blockers going one-on-one -on -one against the jammer while their teammates swoop in to defend. Uh, sometimes this happens repeatedly where every time the jammer slips one blocker, another takes their place. Uh, I usually hear that described as waterfalling, um, but regardless, uh, you see a lot of that when, when teams get super aggressive, um, you, you end up going one-on-one -on -one for a while. Um, okay, so uh, now that we're on the same page about offense and defense, we've talked about those concepts. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how to adjust your uh, play uh, during a game. Okay, so obviously playing entirely defensively or entirely offensively is not really an option. But we can put on our defense hat and we can think about how to play offense in a defensive manner. Since being more defensive is about making fewer mistakes and being more in control of the situation, you want to wait until you have that control before going off to play offense. That means starting off your jams, you may want to have all four blockers playing defense until you're really ready to separate from the wall. In our league, we practice switching from D to O by, switch, by starting out with a jammer pushing on a four wall and then having someone separate from the wall and move forward to play it, like an imaginary O on not real blockers um, for, for at least a couple seconds, and then moving back to reform. Uh, like with everything else I've been talking about, this is something you need to practice to be able to do in a real game. So uh, every time you think about, oh, this is something I might want to do on game day, you definitely want to find a way to create a drill that will let you practice that skill uh, so that you're not doing it for the first time when you need to do it right. <laughs> All right, so uh, while you're at it, you may want to avoid being in the apexes. If you have to speed up play slightly to get out of the apexes, it's totally an acceptable cost. But regardless, you don't want to hang out there 
where a well-timed apex jump can make it seem like you don't have any blockers anyway. Um, a lot of the apex dynamics are uh, about edges, and uh, aggressive teams are going to be um, just better uh, against uh, the, the edges. Uh, everything about being more defensive is also about having more control. So it shouldn't be surprising that the that that includes moving from one lane to another. Uh, shuffle stepping where is where you pick up your skates and step over a lane rather than like kicking out and skating over a lane. And it can be a really great way to make lane adjustments uh, without introducing a ton of motion into your skates. Uh, less motion, of course, means more control. And lastly, you always want to be linked up with somebody. Even if you're in the front of the pack, you're both in front of the pack waiting for the jammer to make their way forward. Most jammers can push a single blocker out of play with ease. And if you don't have a partner, you just have to hope you can defend all by yourself. Two blockers are more than twice as effective. Cool. So that's, that's how to be more defensive. Of course, the other way to go is to play more offense. Uh, we can't give up defense entirely, but we can think about how to play uh, defense in a more offensive manner. Uh, this is maybe not the most revolutionary idea, but of course, we can play offense right from the very beginning of a jam. And uh, we can expect that the other three blockers will handle the defense. This represents a training opportunity as well. Um, some high-level teams like to pair up their offensive players with specific jammers. Or they like to train particular people in each pod or line to play offense. What you want to avoid when you're focusing on defense is um, often that uh, you, you want to attempt to achieve, um, sorry, what you are want to avoid when you're focusing on defense is often what you're attempting to achieve when you're playing offense. Uh, the apexes are particularly vulnerable to exploitation on the edges. So if you want to be aggressive, uh, push play into the apexes. Let your jammers practice their footwork on the enemy team. You don't only have to play there, but don't stand around in the straightaway if you can slide forward just a bit. Um, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Practicing dynamic offense, uh, man, dynamic offense is a miracle. Specifically, what I'm talking about is uh, the ability to play quick offense against an opposing blocker as you reform. Uh, this is typically done from the front, and it's usually uh, done with a dedicated O uh, as well. So you have an offensive player, um, and then you have the person who's playing a dynamic offense, and then you have the two blockers that are uh, going to be reforming. Um, I wonder, can I switch over to the whiteboard real quick? I think I'm going to try that. Ha ha. I'm going to try a thing. Please uh, don't don't worry if uh, all right, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about a track. I have a thing. Draw. Here we go. All right. So imagine we're here. This is like the beginning of the apex. Can everybody see this by the way? Okay, cool. Uh so um I want to go this is typically a start line thing. So you have uh, you have the opposing team lined up on the start line, and they will often end up something like uh, one, two, three, four. You end up with that, and then on the other side, you're going to end up with um, one, two, three. And then four. And your jammer is going to be right here. We do this. And their jammer is going to be right here. Cool. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, you get two people playing offense. So this person right here is dedicated O, and they play offense this way. This person right here, uh, right next to them, is going to play a momentary offense that goes here to here. And then this will reform into your triangle. 
That's what I mean by dynamic offense. That usually clears the inside lane, and then your jammer gets out this way, while at the same time, uh, it actually makes this jammer's life harder because this blocker is always looking into the lane. Does everyone understand that? <laughs> Hopefully my like meager drawing skills <laughs> are, are OK. Great, that's great to hear. Uh, well, you, you usually have to pick a side. Um, that's a good question. You have to pick a side uh, to play offense on. You don't always have to play offense from the side. You can sometimes play offense from the middle, but that's a much deeper strategy. Usually, people will find it a lot easier to just play. And, and the vast majority, even at high level, uh, High level derby is going to be from the uh, from the edges towards the center, and you always want to be focusing on one edge and not both. Um, you usually play uh, heavy offense on one side and then no offense on the other. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the presentation. <laughs> All right. So uh, dynamic offense, pretty great. Um, this uh, takes a lot of practice to get right. If you do, uh, you can play offense even as someone is in a box. Um, that, that's what dynamic offense lets you do. So if you've ever had like a three versus four situation and you still want to play a little bit of offense, this is a really great way to do it. And uh, since offense has a way of speeding up play, see so it's sort of related, um, you want to be comfortable with all the different kinds of blocks and match them to the current speed of play. It doesn't hurt to practice pack control as well. This is what I mean by all of these concepts being interconnected. Uh, you can think of them separately, but they will all work together. Okay. So uh, this next set of concepts is about conditioning. And uh, as such, it's, uh, th there's not as much here that you can adjust on the day of a game. But I didn't really want to talk about all these other concepts that are trainable and leave out conditioning. You can condition your team to have specific physical attributes. And you need to be prepared for what the attributes your opposing team might have um, when you make your adjustments. Here, I'm mostly going to talk about strength versus agility. Um, yeah, uh, let's get into it. <laughs> I'm just going to move on. Right. So the physical game is definitely my favorite to watch from the stands. Uh, big gals making huge blocks, clearing a skater across the track make a real good derby. Uh, but focusing on big punishing hits can be more than its own reward. Uh, strategically, Teams that keep taking big hits will start to avoid being in places where they can be hit. They'll make more technical errors on the track. They'll take longer to get up after the fourth, fifth, or sixth time that you take them off the track. Um, and of course, here I do want to pause and say uh, physicality is always about making hits legally and safely. As coaches, I feel like it's a pretty big responsibility of ours to ensure that our skaters are always taking that to heart. So. Yeah, moralizing over. <laughs> uh, you, can, uh, you can make your game more physical by increasing the amount of separation between you and your target before you block them. So if you're coming all the way across the track, that's going to be a bigger hit, obviously, than uh, if you're blocking from right next door. Uh, your goal is not simply to displace them like a lane. It's to take them off the track entirely and make them have to take the extra time and energy to pick themselves up. Uh, you can drill and use hits that are more likely to have that effect, such as um, checkmark hits and forward-facing hits. Does everyone know what I mean by a forward-facing hit, by the way? OK, cool. So some of you know one, some of you know the other. All right, so I'll explain checkmarks, and then I'll explain forward-facing hits. All right, so checkmark is where you are um, descending, your body lowers, so you crunch down on um, real low, and then you pop back up, and then um, uh, as, you're, as you're making contact with your uh, opponent, 
the target. Um, so when you do that descent, uh, and then when you make contact and come upwards, uh, the direction of force is going to be upwards, and that helps take people off their face. Uh, so I hopefully that makes sense why you would do that. Um, it, it is something you, you probably need to practice because the uh, getting underneath someone and then like pushing up. Uh, usually this is done side by side, um, and so you you drop down and then pop back up, and that's why it's called a check mark, right? Because you have. Um, ooh, how do I clear this? <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, uh, if you have a person-shaped thing, oh, thank you, <laughs> magical elves. <laughs> Uh, so if you have a person-shaped skater type thing, and then you have another person who's real low, right? They're bending, and then they come, so they come down, and then they come back up through their hits, and then that's a check mark. Uh, in terms of forward facing, it's oh, oh, yeah, I should make sure that that's cool. You uh, you get it now. Um, I'm waiting for the the typing. <laughs> Okay, um, the forward-facing hits are uh, going to be targeting uh, targeting someone and making chest contact with some part of their body. Uh, usually, it's done as a last chance hit as as a jammer attempts to get out on the outside line. So you'll come across the track, charging more or less straight at them, and then make chest contact um, and then bump them off the track. Uh, they could be bigger hits and uh, and very exciting at the same time. <laughs> uh, a lot of times they end up with you going out as well, but not always. And if you practice that, you can do uh, a better job of that. Um, it, it is often the case in a more physical oriented game that you're not as concerned with going out yourself because you're making such big hits. So if you hit someone and you clear them off the track and they go off of their skates and they go all the way to the ground and you go out, yeah, they can get back up and come back in in front of you, but frequently the pack is going to move ahead of them. So you, because you hit them so hard and they have to take time in order to get up, it's not a big deal. All right. So that's the physical game. Um, let's talk about the agility game. OK. Some people, when they skate, it's a smooth, graceful, ballet-esque movement. That's what I mean when I talk about agility. People that focus on agility can be strong, they can be powerful in those movements, but the movements are fast, controlled, and never in one place for too long. That fluidity in movement translates into how they move through the pack. An agile team can seep through tiny cracks in the wall and uh, all position themselves on the other side of it. They don't get concerned when the pack starts to speed up because they know their ability to move through the pack is even higher now. Agile jammers are known for the, their gravity-defying stunts on the lines. But within some level of variance, you can focus your team on playing a more agile game. The trick is to focus on being adaptable and plastic about your approach. You don't want to overcommit. You want to be willing to follow your jammer from one side of the track to the other. You want to adopt looser formations instead of just strict geometry. Uh, you might use formations that are partially open. Uh, you want to work on side-by-side -side blocking in practice. Um, for instance, you might have a jammer pushing on a triangle to start and then have the braces release their two corners, then reestablish the links before things completely fall apart. Just to practice that um, catch and release kind of thing where uh, you, you need to be dynamic. Agility moves are more jammer-oriented. Uh, because blockers usually don't face the same pressures the jammers do. But you can introduce all sorts of technical moves to evade and confuse your opponent as you ramp up your agility in the game. Um, do all of these specific moves make sense to people? Cool. Great. You've all heard of these. That's great. Um, I always get... Uh, I. I always get flustered because derby, derby terminology is not standardized, so you just can never be sure. Um, okay, so let's talk about conditioning. 
strength training. Uh, strength training is a matter of bulking up, usually through a lot of hard work. Uh, you can encourage weightlifting outside of practice, or you can find ways to bring it into your practice. Either way, you're going to want to focus on building up muscle mass if you want to emphasize physicality in a game. Uh, weightlifting is particularly useful for upper body development. Um, hot tip, a lot of gyms will cut you a group discount, so that might be a place to explore if you're not already doing so. Otherwise, even just investing in some cheap water jugs could make it possible to cobble together a weight system. Um, body weight exercises are more likely to find their way into derby conditioning because they don't require any equipment. Uh, anything that works the quads or the hip flexors is going to be high value. Yeah, we, we love ours too. Uh, it's a huge way of um, uh, reducing the cost to skaters and, and encouraging them to, to do the extra work outside of practice. Um, yeah, so body weight exercises, you're, you're definitely going to want to work those into a derby practice. Um, squats, lunges, mountain climbers, all that stuff. Um, the dreaded burpee. <laughs> uh, but uh, none of those exercises are going to translate directly into hitting. I really, really recommend you invest in a training pad to practice hitting with. Yeah, you, you can hit your friends over and over until they leave practice. <laughs> but a training pad is both easier on your skaters and it also helps with their mental game. It may seem strange, but a lot of learning to hit well is about getting over your fear. And there's no better way to do that than to try it out in a safe environment. That's what a pad can get for you. All right, so that's strength training. All right, we can talk about agility training. Um, in the same way that uh, strength training, uh, hitting training is going to be a little bit mental, agility training is basically two-thirds mental. Uh, I say that because where physicality is a lot about muscle mass and bulk, uh, a lot of agility is actually about technical execution. So no matter how impressive a high-level derby skater is on their skates, I guarantee you that's hours and hours of repetition until the skill isn't even something that they think about anymore. So you have to do footwork drills over and over until they become second nature. Of these, I think hockey stops are my favorite to work. It's because um, hockey stops stress edge work a lot. They stress it's secretly also a drill about how to block better. So it's kind of a two for one. Uh, but that's just me. Uh, whatever you choose to focus on, you just need to drill it like monthly. It needs to be something you go over routinely. Now for chaining drills, um, for chaining drills, I'm going to talk about the other aspect of agility, which is the, the ability to stretch, or sorry, stitch two skating movements together in a smooth progression. In my experience, it's mostly a mental thing. Uh, you can have a skater who can do really great spins in isolation uh, and really great toe stop runs in isolation. But when they try and do it back to back, there's a huge lag between the two skills. That's the kind of thing you have to drill relentlessly. Uh, you could just do those things and practice chaining two skills together um, until it's quick. Oh, advice on working hockey stops on a super sticky floor. Uh, yeah, we're, we're actually going to talk about floors a little bit later, but um, you really need super hard wheels. Uh, the combination of your floor plus your uh, wheels is going to determine. There are going to be some issues with, uh, when you say super sticky, do you mean rough concrete? Wood in a humid environment. OK. Yeah, OK, I can see how that would be sticky. Um, yeah, so there are some fine adjustments I could suggest. Um, maybe we could talk offline about that. Uh, but you are going to find it harder to work hockey stops if, you're, um, if your floor is really sticky. Uh, and you may find it more useful to spend that time on other footwork drills rather than working around your floor. Um, I have sometimes found opportunities to go to other venues and practice a skill. 
so that's another thing you can consider is whether or not there's um, like a, a skating rink that you can rent for a little while and practice hockey stops or something along those lines. No problem. All right, so um, for the remaining one third of the two thirds that I was talking about, um, there's really only plyometrics. Uh, if you can figure out how to get some boxes and do box jumps, or better yet, um, I prefer depth jumps, uh, that's, the, that's really the best. Um, if not, you can do Hayden's or ski jumps. I actually do both. Uh, we do depth jumps, Hayden's, ski jumps, frog jumps. That's sort of like a whole routine. Uh, any sort of bursty, jumpy thing is probably going to be plyometric. And of course, you can, you can Google this stuff. It's not, uh, not hard to find. Uh, but yeah, getting some boxes is, is really going to help uh, up your conditioning game when it comes to agility training. Cool. So moving on to environment, uh, this is exactly what you were talking about before, about the floor. Um, that's, we've, we've pretty much covered all the stuff that you have direct control over. Uh, the rest of this is going to be about stuff that happens uh, between the teams, like the track that you're skating on, the refing environment. We usually don't have much of a say in either of those things, uh, but we do have things to adjust based on them. So let's talk about what we can do. Okay. Cool. Now, not to gear head out on you, but track surface is really important. <laughs> Knowing what kind of surface you'll be skating on can mean the difference between a win and a loss. Slick floors will tend to favor um, the team that is more agile or used to skating at speed. On the other hand, there are some sticky floors that we would call blocker floors, where it's just going to favor the team that knows how to dig in. The hardness of your wheels will play a huge part in how the floor feels. It's worth asking your team what wheels they own and to make a plan around the floor if you can. We've had venues where we skate at where we've had to gear down all the way to 84. And we've had other venues where the surface needs something as hard as 95s. So it could be a huge range. And I really encourage everyone to build up, if they can, a wheel library that's not always accessible for all of your skaters. But um, being able to hit at least, um, I would say, 88, 92, and 86 are like, if you were going to pick three wheels at random, just try those, and you probably will cover a, a, a majority of floors. Um, thermal regulation is also one of my pet topics. Uh, I think a lot of skaters underestimate how hot their core temp gets when they skate. Uh, and I think as a sport, we don't do enough to accommodate that. Heat leads to muscle fatigue, um, which can lead to missed opportunities or worse, injury. Uh, bringing ice packs to a game and preemptively cooling skaters can make a noticeable difference in how they perform. The same is true for a high humidity environment. You were talking about humid. Um, not being able to sweat off heat uh, is a real problem. So having cooling on hand to help with that is a big deal. And lastly, we should talk about communicating. Um, if you're not working with hand signs already, you definitely should. A typical set of hand signs will include, at the minimum, one for calling off the jam, one for continuing the jam, and one for getting your next pass and then calling it off. Um, uh, I think my translator is, is broken. Uh, is anyone using the translation? Uh, if so, uh, I'll, I'll restart it. Okay. Cool. Uh, all right. Well, cool. I'll just I'll just keep pressing on them. Um, so yeah, uh, those three hand signs are probably going to be the things that you really need. You might also add things like a sign to indicate that you need to kill penalty time to get skaters out of the box, or for the blockers to play all offense. I've yet to find someone who can yell loudly enough to drown out a rowdy crowd, so the visual aspect is essential to this. OK, uh, refing. OK, as for the officiating, I'm going to start with a preemptive, I think refs are great caveat. <laughs> Without refs, we don't have roller derby. And I think it's important we approach discussions around refs with some respect for what they do for us. But in just the same way that not all skaters hit with the same frequency, not all refs will call every penalty the same. Some will call the game a lot tighter, and others call it a lot looser. 
One of the biggest things you can do to adjust during a game is to figure out what refing environment you're in. You need to know which refs call everything they see and which refs are focused on only playing their position. If you have not yet, I strongly encourage you to spend time as an official. It will radically expand your understanding of the game. I have spent time as a ref in the center of our track <laughs> without skates. So if you don't skate, um, I don't I don't know if anybody here is a non-skating coach. I'm I'm one of a few, I think. <laughs> Um, if you don't skate, it's still okay. You can you can almost always uh, participate on the inside of the track. Cool, definitely. I I, I, I feel you. <laughs> uh, but try ask if you can ref on on feet, and most refs ref crews will be more than willing uh, to try it. Um, doing this will expand your mind about why uh, the refs call things the way they do. And you'll become a lot more, first of all, empathetic about what refs go through. But also, uh, in a game, you'll be able to determine whether or not the refs could have seen something and not waste an official review that you know you can't win. I see that a lot, by the way. <laughs> OK. Um, in any case, uh, I, I think you can think of the refs like terrain. Uh, the ones that call things a lot are going to be more treacherous terrain, but it's dangerous for both teams. Uh, it's typically the case with uh, inside refs versus outside refs. If the outside refs are less experienced, and they tend to be, you may find that they call less penalties. If this ends up being uh, the case, you really want your jammer to work the outside and the opposing jammer to deal with the harder inside refs. There's a, a fun fact that I learned this year <laughs> uh, playing against Montreal. Um, or no, sorry, Quebec. Um, anyway, but the point is that um, uh, you definitely want your jammer to be on the softer side if you can. Uh, in any case, uh, I've coached for about three years. I've had dozens of games with dozens more refs that I've had the pleasure to encounter. In that time, I have complained bitterly about the refs. <laughs> uh, but with the advantage of hindsight, I found that it, I was only doing myself and my team a disservice by complaining. If you see something weird about the refing, don't fault the refs, adapt to them, and use it to your advantage, uh, or you'll suffer when your opponent does. Uh, yeah, so this is the default image in Keynote. <laughs> uh, I threw this slide in because we are now, uh, we're, we're done with all of the stuff, uh, all the dimensions that I wanted to talk about, uh, but I haven't really talked about putting them all together. So is everybody ready to move on, or uh, are there any other questions? We've got to be a little bit quick, because we've got to cover the last couple of minutes. And OK, cool, great. Let's, let's just move on. All right, so uh, putting it all together is a matter of looking at your team, asking yourself the hard questions of what do we do well, what do we struggle with, what do our opponents do well, what do our opponents struggle with. Um, for instance, you might say to yourself, well, we're pretty good on our skates. We feel comfortable moving around on the track, but our opponents are twice our size. Well, excellent. It sounds like you want to push play a little faster and exploit your ability to outmaneuver the opposition. Or you might say, well, we're pretty evenly matched, but our skaters are a little bit more um, penalty heavy uh, than I'd like. And our opponent tends to play mostly reactively and focuses on defense. OK, great. Uh, let's play a bit of dedicated offense and start to exploit the edge we think is less dangerous with respect to the, uh, the refs. Important to all this is that it helps to do the work before you get to the track. If you wait until the day of the game and you have no idea what you're up against, you can find these answers on the track, but it will be faster if you've done prep work before. This is um, one thing I remember making a note of about uh, Perth when we went to Mayday Mayhem. Um, they would open up with about five to 10 minutes of gameplay. And pretty much like clockwork, they would take a timeout. The first timeout was always a strategy discussion where they would change how they were playing to adapt to their opponents. And it worked super well for them. Uh, once you've done enough prep work and you can start to see these dimensions uh, emerging in play, you could say, oh, play is getting really fast. Cool. What does that mean for me? Do I want to keep going fast? Do I want to slow it down? How do I slow it down? Um, thinking through those dimensions gives you the opportunity to sort of cobble together an answer. OK. Um, so let's talk about our case study. Remember, we, we started this talking about Denver versus Arch, right? Um, Denver versus Arch, November 9th, uh, all the halcyon days of three weeks ago. 
in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. Uh, this is a look at the championships game four, so if you want to find it online, it's a beautiful game. Um, I'm obviously going to be taking the position of Denver because I'm from Colorado, so like whatever. <laughs> Uh, the first period's been a grindhouse game. Uh, the game has been with, within 20 points the whole time. Uh, that means that both teams have been playing slow. It's been technical derby. It's been um, hard hitting. Arch is displaying a huge level of physicality. Hard hitting, slow derby. Um, and most of the points that DRD has, has scored actually have come from super fancy moves on the edges. Uh, Scald Eagle or whatever, doing pirouettes, <laughs> you know, making, making blockers look regret their life choices, that sort of thing. Um, cool. And uh, we know that New Orleans humidity is a bit higher, and the track is polished concrete. So in other words, um, we're expecting uh, the surface to be a little slicker. Uh, the penalties are a little heavier on the DRD side. So that leads us to make a set of recommendations. So we can. Uh, we can look at this and we can say, cool, well, maybe we should speed up play and rely on our better agility to exploit the edges of the track. Since we know that the edges of the track have been good for us, and we know that um, as play speeds up, penalties are uh, easier to, you'll see less um, penalties uh, except for like contact, like serious uh, safety issues will always be called, but um, you might miss like a, a transitory form that would otherwise in slow derby maybe get called. Um, it also, yeah, so speeding up play also cuts down Arch's penalty advantage. Um, given the slickness of the floor, it will also make it a little bit, um, a little bit easier to do, uh, to, speed, to speed play up. Of course, uh, if we're going to do this, we might as well play more offense off the line, uh, including uh, the double tap offenses. Uh, Denver is particularly good at these dynamic offenses. Um, we can drive forward when we're playing single O. So if we're playing as a single offense person, we're going to push on one person and then drive them forward. Um, you can play more dynamic offenses and rely on individual blocking skills when moving forward in the pack. You'll definitely want to shy away from huge hits. And instead, you're going to want to focus on spreading out Arch's blockers. If you stay in the pack and you can slow down an opposing blocker before you reform, great. Uh, that sort of positional blocking that we tend to do when things get faster. And then um, just to introduce more fluidity, more, um, more mobility into the jams, uh, radical repositioning at the start of the jams uh, does that. You see um, Denver does this thing where they like to start up front and then really quickly, right, right as the five seconds happens, they, they move back or sometimes they'll start at the, the start line, but then they'll radically reposition to in front of the other wall, uh, those sorts of things. Okay, so um, yeah, so the result of this is, of course, an overwhelming victory for Denver. Um, putting all of these pieces to get together uh, will help you um, uh, achieve this kind of result. So it's little things that are compounded and compounded and compounded. But you can get to this result even faster if you've done all the prep work. So I, I strongly encourage you to think through these problems in advance. Um, but this is the kind of this is the kind of game that we want to be in. This is the kind of game where things are tough, they're difficult. You're up against a, a even matchup, and then you apply strategy and you get, you know, uh, a two to one kind of victory. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it is time, so I really, I really shouldn't be <laughs> taking up too much more time. Um, and uh, I think we're going to call it here. My email is always open. You're welcome to email me if you have any questions about any of this material or just any questions in general. I'm happy to answer. Um, you can find me on Twitter, uh, whatever it is you, you want to do. It was really great to uh, talk with all of you today. Yeah, no problem. Great, great. Uh, I don't have any more resources online, but I, um, I, you will be getting the copy of this um, presentation, I believe. Oh, I do actually have a, a blog uh, that I occasionally post to, a Medium blog. Uh, let's see if I can 
pull that up real quick. I am uh, Papa Whiskey on there as well. Okay, we'll post it to the group. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, and um, goodbye. <laughs>